When it comes to Disney parks with troubled history, California Adventure is at the very top of the list. I mean, sure, today it's a well-themed, cohesive, and dare I say, charming theme park. But when Disney's California Adventure first opened 20 years ago, it was a whole other story. And the tale of how this fundamentally broken Disney park came to be is filled with struggle, drama, and unrealized potential. So sit back, relax, and let's take a deep dive into the truly disastrous history of Disney's California Adventure. The story begins with the construction of Disney's MGM Studios in 1987, which was soon to become the third East Coast Disney theme park. However, back over on the West Coast in the city of Anaheim, Disney still had just a single theme park. Of course, the single theme park was the original Disneyland, but the park's lack of expansion was growing to be a major source of frustration within the company. You see, MGM Studios would solidify Walt Disney World as the ultimate vacation destination, taking multiple days or even a whole week to experience all it had to offer. Disneyland, on the other hand, was seen as a one to two day maximum experience, visited primarily by locals and those traveling from nearby states. True, under the leadership of newly appointed Disney executives Michael Eisner and Frank Wells, the park had seen a dramatic revitalization in the mid-80s. But despite the surge in park admission, Disneyland was still far from the status of Walt Disney World. So as work began on Florida's third Disney theme park, so too began the mission of adding more Disney experiences to Southern California. It's very important in the way uh, that we relate to this, you'll find as we get further and further into this that we get into I suppose you have to admit, crazier and crazier ideas. The first attempt was actually a few years before MGM Studios opened, with a proposed second Disney theme park and entertainment center not in the city of Anaheim, but the city of Burbank. Essentially, this would have been a West Coast version of Disney's MGM Studios, but with a larger emphasis on themed shopping, dining, nightlife activities, and quote, a new generation of Disney attractions. However, despite getting pretty far in the planning stages and receiving approval from city officials, Disney pulled the plug when development costs more than doubled, offsetting any potential profit. So plans for a second Disney theme park, or Disneyland Resort, were put on hold. But not for long. Eisner announced at a packed news conference that Disneyland will get beefed up during the next 10 years and is even going to get a brand new sister theme park nearby. And as far as the brand new theme park here in California, Eisner says it hasn't been decided what kind of park it will be. In 1990, as part of the so-called Disney Decade, the company announced a slew of new expansions to the original Disney park. There was to be a complete transformation of Tomorrowland with a stunning new aesthetic and a host of incredible attractions. The Magic Kingdom's Mickey's Starland, which began as Mickey's Birthdayland, was also to come to the Anaheim Park. As if that wasn't enticing enough, the upcoming MGM Studios Sunset Boulevard expansion and parts of Roger Rabbit's Hollywood, aka Toontown, was also part of the plan. These would have been combined into a new land called Hollywood Land and would have also featured the great movie ride. However, in addition to the expansions within the original park was to be a brand new theme park right next to Disneyland. Maybe. You see, in 1990, Disney had two simultaneous proposals for a second theme park in California. One of them was Disney Sea in the city of Long Beach and would have featured attractions and lands based on the myths, mysteries, and wonders of the ocean. But Disney Sea was to be part of a much larger resort by the name of Port Disney, with an estimated budget of a whopping $3 billion. A few billion? At the same time, Disney was also proposing another $3 billion resort, but this one right across from Disneyland with an alternate second theme park. Westcott. As the name implies, Westcott was to be a West Coast version of Florida's Epcot Center. However, unlike Epcot, which outside of the World Showcase was increasingly criticized for having the appearance of a dated concrete wasteland, Westcott was to be full of life and bustling with energy. As initially envisioned, Westcott would have had three main pavilions, the wonders of Earth, the wonders of living, and the wonders of space. The World Showcase would have also been dramatically expanded, focusing on the four corners of the Earth, Asia, Europe, the Americas, and Africa. Epcot's iconic spaceship Earth was also to be nearly twice the size, with a far more futuristic appearance and a ton of reflective lighting. Now for both of these resorts, Disney would have required either the city of Long Beach or Anaheim to provide a significant portion of the funding. 
In the case of Anaheim, it was to unify the surrounding streets and businesses, presenting a much more appealing aesthetic for a true resort destination. However, when I say a significant portion of funding, I mean somewhere between a staggering $800 million to $1 billion. Some have even speculated that the only reason DisneySea was even conceived was to put pressure on Anaheim City officials for the Disneyland Resort. After all, Disneyland was the primary source of Anaheim's tens of millions of dollars worth of tax revenues, creating thousands of jobs and driving the tourism which supported hundreds of local businesses. By 1991, the decision was made, with Disneyport being cancelled and the official plans for the Disneyland Resort in Westcott being made public. But then a new set of troubles began. What's the capital of California? You see, the nightly fireworks, traffic congestion, and swarm of tourists was already a frequent complaint to those living near the Disneyland park. So the idea of an even bigger theme park brightening up the skies and attracting tourists from all over the world didn't go over too well with the community. Disney even wound up redesigning Westcott, which promised a far less bombastic and disruptive tourist attraction. But that was only part of the issue. You see, while the Disney World property was made up of a whopping 30,000 acres, the Disneyland property was only about 400. This consisted of the park itself, the 100-acre parking lot, and the recently acquired Disneyland Hotel and Vacationland property from the Rattler Corporation. And just for comparison, imagine the blue square as Disneyland. Yeah, it's pretty drastic. So part of Disney's expansion plans contained at least 100 acres of additional property, which was to be acquired by the city. The master plan released to the public did include this, but someone on the Disney team neglected to inform those who already owned the property. One case was a man by the name of Joe Slutsky, who was shocked to see his business right where Disney was planning to build a new parking garage. While Disney ultimately decided to alter the plans, the damage was already done. Disney was seen as a villain of the community. To make matters worse, funding from the city became a major problem and forced Disney to repeatedly downscale the scope of the entire project. However, one of the final nails in the coffin for this version of the Disneyland Resort, which included Westcott, was Euro Disneyland. Hey, maintenant, je déclare Euro Disney officiellement ouvert. Now the abysmal performance of the Paris theme park is often the butt of many jokes, and is often used to explain countless abandoned Disney attractions and expansions, but it's also the case here. It shattered Disney's confidence in building yet another massive multi-billion dollar resort, and shifted the company's priorities into financial recovery and stability. But there's a final aspect that forever doomed the second California theme park, one that would have a ripple effect lasting well over a decade. The death of Frank Wells. One month after Frank Wells' 62nd birthday, he was involved in a helicopter crash on a ski trip in Nevada's Ruby Mountains. His passing had a devastating impact on Michael Eisner, who up until then could focus solely on the creative aspects of the parks, with Frank Wells on the business side to keep his ideas in check. But now Eisner was left to deal with the financial disaster of Euro Disney all on his own. Three months later, Eisner underwent bypass heart surgery, and it seems that between these two life-changing events, he lost the creative drive that began the original park's renaissance all those years earlier. The combination of all these factors led to the cancellation of this version for the Disneyland Resort, and with it, the dreams of Westcott. You know, after Walt learned about all the negative reaction to the opening day at Disneyland, he was bound and determined to personally fix the problems. Now, two Disney insiders here at the park, everybody knows Mickey and Minnie, they tell me that Walt was going to do whatever it takes to make his dream come true. Despite the cancellation of Westcott, it didn't change the problem that inspired this massive undertaking in the first place. Disneyland needed to expand and become a true theme park resort destination. And though a far cry from the initially requested funds, Anaheim was still willing to invest into improving the surrounding Disneyland property. So as the story goes, in August of 1995, Michael Eisner and his team of Imagineers and executives held a three-day retreat in Aspen, Colorado. The goal of this impromptu trip was finding a new solution at a fraction of the cost and scale of the original plans, and it seems they broke down the Disneyland problem as follows. The people visiting Disneyland consisted primarily of California residents, locals, or those who lived in nearby states. The ones that were from another part of the US, or even another country, likely had Disneyland as just one of the many vacation destinations within California. So evidently Michael Eisner came up with a brilliant idea a Disney park themed and inspired by all the experiences you can have in California. That way, visitors wouldn't feel need to even leave the resort. 
Plus, and this was a big factor for Disney, both the park and resort could be done at nearly a third of the cost of the original expansion, at just over $1 billion. The downscaling of the resort also meant less expensive hotels, a single parking garage, and very little additional property acquisition, with most of it residing on the Disneyland parking lot. And while on paper this might have seemed like a good idea, you'll soon see otherwise. George Lucas returns to Disneyland with Alien Encounter. Further ahead, Baby Herman's runaway buggy ride through a whole new area in the park. Hollywoodland, where park guests will appear in classic films of yesterday and television of tomorrow. Now before going further, it's important to mention the expansions within the original park I mentioned earlier, as this was also a victim of the new budget reduction. The new Tomorrowland, or Tomorrowland 2055, was altogether scrapped, and the land would instead see a far cheaper version inspired by Disneyland Paris' Discovery Land. The Mickey Starland clone and Roger Rabbit Land concepts were also abandoned, at least as standalone locations, instead putting the two together into Mickey's Toontown, featuring Roger Rabbit. The Sunset Boulevard-inspired Hollywood Land was also scrapped, at least for Disneyland. Instead, it was chosen to reside within this California Adventure theme park. However, it seems it was no longer to feature the great movie ride. That being said, let's explore the initial vision for Disney's California Adventure, because the initial plans were quite different from what became a reality. First and foremost, California Adventure was to feature the Golden Spire from the abandoned Westcott. This was intended to be seen from miles away, spiking the curiosity of those unfamiliar with the Disney parks. Upon entering Disney's California Adventure, you would have an even better view of this monolithic structure. You might also notice a representation of California's iconic missions, which was to be a much larger part of the entire resort as a whole. But for those unaware, the California missions are historical landmarks, but they're also associated with the not-so-Disney topic of slavery. So possibly to avoid another Song of the South situation, in which Disney was criticized for having a complacent view of slavery, little of this would survive into the final version of the park. Our next stop is the original vision for the Hollywood backlot. Now as I said, plans for the great movie ride were abandoned, more than likely due to the legal battle between the non-Disney MGM studios over licensing rights. In its place was initially going to be a high-speed dark ride, in which you would have been chased by the paparazzi on your way to meet Michael Eisner at the Grauman's Chinese Theater to sign a huge movie deal with Disney. Yeah, seriously. The exterior would have been based off the actual Los Angeles airport, but unfortunately visuals of the ride's initial concept are few and far between. Another attraction of Hollywood was to be the animator's desk. This was to be a very elaborate theater presentation slash walkthrough hybrid. On the presentation side, it would have educated audiences on the various processes involved in making animated feature films. The walkthrough portions would have taken visitors through the history and evolution of Walt Disney Animation, with elaborate and interactive set pieces based on their feature films and animated shorts. Next was Golden California, featuring a mesmerizing waterfall flowing from the mouth of Grizzly Peak, foreshadowing one of the park's signature attractions, Grizzly River Run. Now in addition to a handful of wildlife animatronics, the attraction would have also featured a unique but complicated special effect. Somewhere along the journey, a flash flood would have occurred, eventually jumping over guests and chasing them on the other side of the river, before splitting into two waterfalls as they escape its path. The subland of Golden State would have also had a Yosemite-inspired water playground. It seems this actually got pretty far in development, as it appears in quite a few conceptual renderings. There was also apparently an alternate version in the form of a playground called the Eureka Steamworks. Next up is Surf Beach, sometimes referred to as Surf City. Now in addition to a massive lighthouse, this area of the park would have also featured wave pools to allow visitors to try their hand at surfing. This brings to mind the abandoned surf machine of the Magic Kingdom, so it seems Disney wanted to give it another go, but this time in a controlled environment. Though abandoned fairly early in development, it's also worth mentioning Muscle Beach, a playground slash recreation area inspired by California's Venice Beach. Another part of the original California adventure was the original Golden Dreams. Supposedly this was to be an incredible, big-budget, animatronic-filled spectacular on the same level or surpassing Epcot's American Adventure, only showing the Disney-fied highlights of California's evolution. Last but not least was the magnificent, thrilling, and astounding tractor yard. Here visitors could find attractions and walkthroughs celebrating California farming, which was sure to be a highlight for kids visiting a Disney theme park. From the Dream Makers at Disney, an exciting new theme park is coming to Southern California. Located right next door to Disneyland Park, celebrating all the fun and adventure of California. Introducing Disney's California Adventure. 
Construction on Disney's California Adventure commenced in January of 1998, which said goodbye to the original Disneyland parking lot. However, from concept to construction, the already low-budget theme park was scaled back even further, resulting in the loss and alterations to a number of experiences. The culprit was by and large the recently appointed president of Disneyland Operations, and the one chosen to oversee the new Disney park, Paul Pressler. You see, Paul Pressler came from the world of merchandising and cost-cutting retail practices, and he was hired specifically to focus on driving up revenue from the parks by whatever means necessary. In fact, Paul Pressler was behind the closure of the submarine voyage, the massively unimpressive new Tomorrowland, and even the Tiki Room roof collapsing due to a lack of upkeep. Heck, he even shut down the Main Street Electrical Parade in favor of the far less expensive Light Magic Parade. But keep in mind, he was literally hired to put profits before a presentation. In a celebration of Walt Disney's imagination, of his dreams, and of his love for this very special place we call Disneyland, I dedicate the final night of the Main Street Electrical Parade to all of you. Are you Many of the changes to the original vision for California Adventure reflected these same cost-cutting decisions by management to the original park. But let's be clear on something. California Adventure, even if built as envisioned post-Westcott, was fundamentally flawed. It simply strayed way too far from the tried-and-true Disney theme park formula, lacking the magic and sense of immersion of the others. Now the concept of offering all the experiences of California within a single theme park could work, if you built something like the fictional $15 billion man-made city in The Truman Show. Then, you could experience all that California has to offer in a controlled environment. But as it was, minus a few experiences, Disney was building a Disney theme park without any of the magic, charm, or innovation of a Disney theme park. Another issue was Disney's overconfidence in the ability to draw in older crowds, with far too few experiences designed for families with young children. But the true irony is that the jaw-dropping $3 billion Disney Sea concept for Long Beach, or at least a variation of it, was literally being built at the same time in Tokyo. What's really super to the Disney company is that it didn't have to invest one cent in the $600 million extravaganza. Japan's Oriental Land Company, backed by railway and real estate interests, put up the money and will pay Disney royalties. You see, the entire project was being 100% funded by the Oriental Land Company, and much like Tokyo Disneyland, they had a spare-no-expense mentality. The OLC encouraged Imagineers to really shoot for the stars, experiment with new technologies, and most of all create a truly immersive and unique experience for visitors. However, this was not the case for California Adventure, in which Imagineers were all but encouraged to cut corners and throw true immersive experiences out the window. One example was the writer's desk walkthrough, which was drastically reduced in scope to the art of animation, but the redesigned exterior would see yet another reduction in presentation quality. The high-speed superstar limo dark ride probably saw the most drastic alteration, but this had more to do with the tragic death of Princess Diana midway through development. The idea of a comical high-speed chase by the paparazzi was obviously now in bad taste, so between that and severe budget constraints, they opted to downgrade it to a slow-moving dark ride, but we'll dive further into this atrocity a bit later. Surf Beach became Paradise Pier, focusing more on cheap rides, cheap food stands, and cheap carnival games. Golden Dreams went from the animatronic stage show spectacular to little more than a film presentation. The Yosemite-inspired water park, as well as the cascading waterfall from Grizzly Peak, was also scrapped. Heck, even the park's glorious icon of a giant golden spire was downgraded to, as one Imagineer later described, something like you'd find in a shopping mall. Arguably the most offensive removal, of course, was the tractor yard. But don't take my word for it, as in part two we'll explore in detail the California adventure that opened in 2001, the disastrous reception, the early efforts to fix this fundamentally broken Disney park, and its ultimate and ongoing redemption. 